Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gary Edwards, um, and here today at Grey Tech, we're presenting our cabinet software. Before I start, because uh, I can't hear you, can anybody just raise their hand in the panel to make sure you can hear me okay? Great, a few there, thank you very much. So, a quick introduction. My name's Gary Edwards. I'm head of UK sales here for Cabinet in the UK. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Daniel Taylor North, who is our product manager. And he will be doing the demonstration a little bit later on. The aim today is to present for about an hour. I'm gonna do 10 to 15 minutes and, and Daniel will do 40, 45 minutes but it won't be over the hour, we'll keep to the time. So a brief introduction, I'm gonna go through Grey Tech and who we are. Some of you may know us, uh, for those that don't, uh, a quick introduction. The reason why we acquired OpenTree and, and the Cabinet Electronic Data Management software. I'm briefly gonna go through some of the overview of the challenges that we see and how Cabinet can help those in, in today's real world. And when we go on to the demonstration, we're going to be looking at things like creating a project, looking at the folder structure within Cabinet from WIP, shared, published, and enforcing templates, starting a Revit project, although we can uh, use AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT, for today we're going to be using and focusing on Revit. Uh, running that in accordance to ISO 19650 and the file naming, looking at the review and approve process that's built into Cabinet, and the file creation that we can do in accordance to the EIR or the uh, information exchange requirements. And then we're going to show you how within Cabinet we can seamlessly integrate with the common data environments. And in today's example, we're going to be using BIM 360 docs. So it's all about maintaining control of your data and your IP. So briefly about Grey Tech. We are actually the third largest platinum partner for Autodesk today in the world. And we've got a presence not only in EMEA, in America, Canada, Russia, um, and as well as Autodesk partners, we're, we're big developers of our own software. We have a lot of our own IP, and, and if it's power packs or things like Cabinet, this is additional software that we can add to our customers to add value. We're over 30 years old, and although headquarters is in France, I'm out of our head office in Southampton in the UK, uh, but we operate in over 11 countries around the world. We're healthy, profitable, and growing, and that's an important factor in today as Autodesk are changing the marketplace with subscriptions. We're seeing fewer resellers actually in the channel, so it's important to know that we are healthy, stable, and growing, and the third largest today. We have a lot of uh, staff in R&D, so we create our own products. And, and for us, the customer is always first. As you can see, uh, extensive coverage in the UK. There'll always be a local office uh, throughout there. But our presence also throughout France, uh, recently acquisitions in Spain, through EMEA, and across the world. This puts us in a really unique position, unlike uh, other UK partners, you know, we have that coverage. So if you too have offices around the world, we are there to help you support those, those locations. So Cabinet, we actually acquired the company OpenTree in January this year. Okay, so we're four or five months into the journey. But we've seen this piece of software for a long time now. And for us, it was a perfect fit. We have a lot of experience with data and document management, and we see it heavily in the manufacturing industry. But in the architecture and engineering space, we saw a need to uh, adopt something like this into our portfolio. And, and in a nutshell, Cabinet is a BIM compliant, structured software for drawing and document management. It's ideal for architects and engineers to help manage work in progress and apply to a standard. It doesn't have to be VS ISO 19650, but we've built that into our software due to a need in the marketplace. Um, and again, you know, OpenTree, the company themselves, they've been around for a long time. They actually created Cabinet, or Cabinet Formula was created in 2003. And we integrate, whilst we have Autodesk Cats, the actual Cabinet software we like to think of as agnostic. Um, so we have integrated it with things like AutoCAD LT, AutoCAD Revit, and Bentley MicroStation. And we pay a heavy focus on the work, the day-to-day -day work in progress of your projects. 
It's an on-premise solution that, that helps to manage all of the files that you're creating on the projects. Some really good customer names behind us that are using this software, from Atkins to Belfour BT Rail, Dublin City Council, uh, North Midland Constructions, Purcells, so some really strong names there already using this software. Now I won't go into too much detail on this slide because I think we, we've seen this or many of us have seen this in, in presentations that we've, we've seen. You know, we know demand is changing, we know projects are becoming more complex. We know what the technology trends look like this year with 3D printing and drones. But data is something that is becoming more and more important. And I think the realization in the industry is, is starting to filter from the top downstream about how important good structured data is, not only within your organization, but the flow with you collaborating with your supply chain. And the better we can get that data, the more we can do with it, the more satisfied the clients may be because it's meeting their requirements in more detail. Uh, the better we can reuse data and the better we can communicate data up and down the supply chain. And that's pretty much what Cabinet is here to do today is, is to help you get that data in a good structured format. Now, I've broken this down slightly into persona types because I appreciate on the webinar today we'll have different people from different backgrounds. So it's important just to understand where this software fits with each persona. I guess from a business owner's perspective, a lot of these uh, that you can see here are, are common. You know, we know every business wants to, to innovate and, and be different. We know they want to increase turnover and maximize profitability, uh, quality, employing and retaining staff uh, and so forth. But if you take profitability, for example, it's always an interesting one because typically we see profitability affected by two main factors. You know, do we have that brand name behind us where we can command more for our service, thus increasing that profit margin? If we don't, then we've got to normally look within our four walls and see if we can do things more efficiently. Can we do the same for less? And Cabinet is all about uh, helping you to, to standardize, find data quicker, run data through a workflow in a structured way, which all helps with efficiency. From an IT manager's perspective, you know, when we typically talk to IT personnel, they're in charge of many different business systems, and there is always that fear of data becoming locked. I guess when I look at the industry and look at some of the factors that hold it back slightly, data is uh, one of those things we do have to pay particular attention to, because if we invest our data in a certain system and realize it's not the right way to go, it can often be costly and time consuming moving that data from one place to another. Um, we're always looking at security. It's a hot topic in industry at the moment. We see the rogue emails coming through and the things like that. So we're looking to put protection on our data. IT are there to help, you know, reinforce deleted files, heavy reliance on permissions, setting up users and so forth and, and building in a structure with the databases. And again, a little bit later, we'll show you how Cabinet can help with all of that. The BIM manager, the BIM director, or, or anyone who's in charge of BIM within that organization, they have quite a big job on their hands today. There's a lot of documentation out there from the business, uh, from the execution plans to the master information delivery plans. We're moving from BS1192, PAS1192 over to the international standard of 19650. So there's a lot of information to, to get your heads around. But at the same time, pass all of that information downstream to your staff. So we often see that, you know, we've got to adhere to a BIM Level 2 project, but how do we do that profitably without all of the time consuming effort required to educate our workflows? And then as we go through the process, you know, how do we bring in a control process? You know, stop users using different templates, out of date of templates. Help improve collaboration within the business. You know, these people often have to make key decisions, but if they're making decisions based on data that is out of date or is not the latest release, then how confident are they putting their name behind that? Um, a quick look at the exchange information requirements. Uh, this has changed under the ISO uh, naming um, side to information requirements exchange. But one of the important factors to think of in this document is the deliverables, often the deliverables up to a common data environment. 
Do you have to deliver native file formats? Uh, do you have to deliver IFC, PDF? And if you have to do that, how long does it take you to do so? Later in the demo, we'll show you how Cabinet can automate that process. And again, looking at the file, file naming conventions, how you do your revision in and your version in and dropping the minor, etc. There is a lot of data here to, to understand, not only for you, but for all of your staff. Um, and if you are delivering a BIM Level 2 project, the last thing you want to be doing is spending time, effort and resource, which we could deem non-valued activity, making sure this is all correct. Our cabinet software, data document management software, has all of this built in. So when we run it through a workflow, we can automate all of this naming convention, take that headache away from you for time, inefficient activity, and help you maximize on your billable hours. And also when you're sending this up to the common data environment, you know it's going to be accurate first time and it's not likely to be rejected. And finally, we have the, the author, the day-to-day -day user of CAD software or the creator of, of content. They too have to get their heads around ISO 19650, looking at the naming conventions. But what we typically see here with this person or this persona is the amount of time that they spend searching for data. We know that under a conventional way of saving your files, be that Windows, it becomes an unscalable, unmanageable process. People are often very good at creating processes that work for them. And for those people that have been within an organization for a long period of time, hey, it works, we get the job done. But when we get busy, when we need to scale up, when we need to bring new people into the business, how easy is it for them to pick up someone else's system, someone else's process, where is that data? And later on within Cabinet, we'll show you that Cabinet is all about the single source of truth with good quick search tools. And again, multiple uncontrolled copies. We often find this persona will, will have multiple uncontrolled copies on their PC. Hey, I put my hand up to it and, and, and probably fall foul of this myself, but that's just a natural way that we work today. So when we bring in a form of control via a document or file management based system, we can start to become more efficient. And if we become more efficient, we can start to help the organization achieve their top level business objectives. So to summarize really, before I pass you over to Daniel for the, uh, the visual side of things, have a look at, at what Cabinet can do. You know, we know traditional processes work but they are a bit of a struggle. Uh, they add to cost, what we call non-valued activity. Um, we can see projects are becoming even more complex. So if projects become more complex and data becomes greater in size, how are we going to manage that? And an interesting fact, you know, the internet is only 30 years old this year, 30 years old. You know, what does it look like in another 30 years time? So if we don't start to think about these processes today and get those processes in a good controlled order, we can only see things becoming more complex down the line. And what we're looking to achieve with Cabinet is we're really looking to speed things up. We're, we're, we're bringing in structure. We are bringing in more control, but we're not locking things down. Often people have a fear of control. They think control will slow things down and that's not what we're trying to do. But what we're trying to do is help people do what they're getting paid to do, rather than look for data, ask questions, etc. And we're trying to automate the process along the way, reduce errors, have better, visibi better visibility. So if we want to see the who, the what, why, what is happening within our business, we can get all of that information from, from Cabinet. And one of the biggest things for us and which makes us unique in the industry is that we have created seamless integrations with the common data environments today. From Business Collaborator, Viewpoint for Projects, Aconex, Asite, BIM 360 Docs, we have built that into our software. So if you want to uh, send a document to the common data environment on approval, we can do that. Or if you want to wait to the final day of the week, the month, when you've collected all of the data together and push it up, we can do that. 
So we have that tight integration with the common data environments. And all in all, this is a, a big time saver. You know, we know BIM Level 2 and, and BIM projects are not going to go away. They're only going to build traction. So let's make life easier for us. Um, and then the final slide there, you know, looking at the common data environments that we, we can publish to. So I'm going to pass you over to my colleague, Daniel, uh, who I just need to make a presenter quickly. Good afternoon, everybody. And I believe you can hear me. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, right. OK, so we're going to go through um, the individual personas. So we'll start with the IT manager. Um, as you can see here, we're looking at Cabinet as the on-premise solution. OK, so it's not in the cloud. It's an on-premise solution. It's using your existing SQL and file server or file servers. I assume you have multiple in some cases. And that allows you to maintain how you currently do your backups today, how you currently do your disaster recovery today. Um, we're not looking for you to invest in uh, thousands of pounds worth of back-end infrastructure. We're going to use your existing. If you're not using SQL at the moment, then you can use the free SQL and install that on one of your file servers. That's not a problem. Um, from a security point of view, um, we can create all the users that are going to be using Cabinet and the groups that they are in and I therefore apply those permissions to the relevant folders within the project um, via Active Directory. So we can sync your Active Directory, create the users, create the relevant groups inside of Cabinet. So there's not a, a big task there. Then obviously at the moment as an IT manager you may be involved in creating the project, setting up the projects um, for your users to use and create their inside Windows for example. Um, I'm going to show you in the demo how you do that manually today, but um, we have users who use their PIM system, so things like CMAP, Rapport3, those kind of things, where at the point when they win a project, they hit a button inside of Rapport3, CMAP, whatever PIM system is, and it can use our API to automatically generate the project inside the cabinet. So again, uh, less work for individuals to do in the creation of the projects. When you're creating those projects, you're creating them from a controlled project folder structure. OK, so it's a managed structure that only certain people will be able, with the right rights, will be able to create new folders or change names or copy paste in substructures so that you haven't got it where you have in Windows at the moment where everybody can create their own folder or create a miscellaneous folder and everybody puts everything in there. It's a controlled project folder structure which manages and structures your WIP shared and published. And you'll see that when we come to show you the presentation. And then we're also going to ensure they're using the latest approved document templates. So we've made sure they're using the latest approved project template. Now it's looking at the document templates. So they're not using a template that's been on their C drive for the last three years and your address has changed once and your logo has changed as well. Okay, using the latest approved templates. So we're ensuring that we've got structure defined and controlled from day one. So if we then now just switch to my desktop, you can see here, this is Cabinet Explorer. It's designed to look like Windows Explorer in the fact that it's got folders structured on the left-hand side and files on the right-hand side. But instead of seeing things like file size and date modified in the list view here, you obviously see the metadata that's relevant to the type of documents you're currently working on. So if I was working on emails, I might see from, to, sent. If I was working on email, uh, sorry, photographs, I might see date, date, time taken or GPS location where you took the photograph. But obviously we're working on general documents here. So we see things like version, description, intent, stage, etc. OK, but obviously, where did this project come from? What we said we were going to do was create a project. We well, can see this folder structure. It's defined by publish, shared and WIP. And then it's got the WIP substructure under there for all the relevant types of documents that we're interested in. Now, obviously, your structure may look different. And if you have one you prefer and you're working with at the moment, we can import that into Cabinet. But to create a new project structure, what we need to do manually, obviously, if it's created via a PIM system, then we wouldn't have to do this bit. But manually, we can go find our structure. Now there's our structure, you can see the published shared WIP. And if I go under there, you can see the uh, substructure that we just looked at earlier in project one. 
but also as well as the substructure this isn't just dumb folders like it is inside of windows and those folders are pre-configured so they have which templates are available to create documents from in those folders so if we go into reports and go to assessments and go right click new document you'll see that I can create certain reports an environmental one a risk assessment one and it's leading me also to the correct template so we have it predefined in our project folder structure all our document templates and what type of documents can be generated and created within those areas not only that when we talked about AD and the AD groups being brought through each folder will have its own properties and permissions applied so we can see whether or not they can create documents modify documents preview all those kinds of things so the security is predefined as well so now we've got predefined structure predefined templates the numbering systems are predefined and if you're using ISO 19650 then obviously that's pre-configured and as well as all the templates so all we need to do is come into our project say copy like you would in normal windows go to where the root is in this case yours might be down low, low level and you can see it says project 7 now it can do auto numbering it can see there's project 6 there so it puts project 7 but it doesn't have to you can free type the project if you want to it's also contributing to our file name so it knows it's project 7 so it's putting project 7 as a prefix into any documents that get generated through this project but it's also going to contribute OPE open tree as where the owner hit next in this case we're going to say include documents the reason why I'm saying include documents in this case is because much like you would have in normal um, windows folder structures you may have files in there that you say every project should have these particular types of documents so in our case we've got a project summary file at the root of our project we'll come back to that in a moment but at this point we may have this pre-populated by a link via some uh, pin system but if we're doing it manually we can still connect to any sql systems that we may have internally and suck the information out of those systems so if this was our PIM system SQL based we could come into here and say right Glasgow Airport runway extension okay and it'll fill the keywords in for us we could link to our CRM system and say that's DNV consulting and we could say okay and it's filled in DNV consulting Aberdeen and this one here is Glasgow Airport runway extension so as well as now populating all our project keywords automatically from the SQL queries we can also decide if this project is going to be linked to any CD any common data environment now it might be our CD it might be a client CD but for every project from every other client we may have a different CD so in some cases for one project from client A we may have to deliver to AconX the next client is using ASI the next client is using BIM 360 and obviously we may have multiple clients using BIM 360 so we may have multiple projects multiple areas to deliver to so in this case we're going into our open tree one then we can decide what we want to deliver so regarding your EIR are you delivering both files both the native file i.e a DWG file and the PDF are you delivering the Revit file and the IFC or just the IFC in this case we're going to deliver what we call the attached which is basically the PDF or the IFC the output file and we're going to hit finish this will create a project with that structure all pre-configured so you can see now I have project 7 and if we go look to the root you can see there's project 7 Glasgow Airport runway extension DMV consulting and in the root of that project 7 I have my project summary file we can see that it's called project 7 automatically I haven't had to rename it or do anything with it because it knows where it lives I can open that now and it does something what we call IDL intelligent data linking so we can link any information out of our database and populate it straight into our documents or into our heads and footers of our documents or into the title blocks of our drawings our AutoCAD files our Revit models DMV consulting it's also putting down there the project number the file name automatically so it's pre-populated and created our project summary report just by opening and creating the document now that obviously got that information from the metadata we populated and we sucked out of the SQL queries or maybe our CRM system our other PIM system but let's go to project one cabinet house camp demonstration open tree Stokesy business park if we go into there you'll see I don't have one now I could create one from a template 
I could go right click in here and say new document and it'll allow me to create a project summary. But like all kinds of documents, you don't go and create a new document every time. If you did something similar or a drawing three months ago, you think I'll take a copy of it and I'll change it. But what you might forget to do is change the header and footer information or change the title block information. So drawing ends up going out where although it's the drawing of a particular building, the address of the building is all wrong because it's you copied and pasted it. But if I come to here now and say paste, so if I come into here and copy the, the file first of all, it'll be a better option. So we copy that, go to the project and say paste in here. You can see it's automatically says it's project one. So it's renamed it automatically because it has a different parent. It now lives in project one. So therefore it renames it automatically. I don't have to think about doing that. It's going to follow the whatever numbering system and then it's going to update all the IDL information automatically for me, including now it says project one down here. So everything's been automatically updated and you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to try and guarantee the quality of the information. You're automating the standardization of your folder structure. You're standardizing your templates. You're standardizing your numbering systems, which we'll come to in more detail in a moment. And you're doing that on an on-premise solution on your existing infrastructure using your active directory permissions in a controlled manner and guaranteeing all the latest approved templates. So if we now come back to this screen here and we say, right, okay, we've looked at what the IT manager was looking at there. We're looking at this really reducing data management section, by the way. Um, if we think of, you may have servers where you have some of your models on and your drawings on and others where you keep your emails somewhere else and your photographs are somewhere else. Okay, and your documents are maybe across multiple file servers and you're looking to centralize things, bring things back together and try to reduce that data management task. Then obviously that's what Cabinet's there to do is to reduce that. So you've got one single source of truth where you can put all that information. So if we look at now the author, what we're going to do is we're going to show you how we go about creating files. So we want to create and import a document. But when we do that, we want it to automate the file naming in accordance in this case to ISO 19650. Um, then we're going to create a Revit project. Um, it's worth noting that when you create Revit projects that we're going to be selecting a template and because Cabinet knows about the different versions of Revit, you can run multiple versions of Revit at the same time. So you might have, I don't know, 17, 18 and 19 running. But if you've got a Revit project 19, 2019, you double click it, it will open up in 2019. And if you double click 2016, it'll open in 2016. So you don't end up getting that auto upgrade mode that Revit tries to do because Cabinet's managing that for you. We're then going to create some Revit sheets and we're going to export them as either PDFs or DVGs. We're going to choose DVGs because we want to show you some other level of configuration we do. And then obviously, as well as creating information and following the numbering system and the file naming convention, we obviously want to be able to find and create reports, especially document registers people are always interested in. So we'll go through that as well. So what we'll do, we'll just switch back to um, Cabinet. Here we go. So we're going to go back to our project seven. We're going to navigate into our WIP area. We're going to go into our reports assessment like we did when it was in a template. And I'm going to say right click new document. Now you'll see, like we did one of the template, it's predefined as to what documents we can create in this folder. It's also worth noting that these intents, as we call them, these little green arrows, first thing they do is drive the user to select the correct template. Okay, so you don't have to worry about where's the latest template. I'm using the latest approved template. That is the latest approved template. The templates themselves are managed within Cabinet. They go through their own workflow and approval and release system. And when they get released, you're instantly using the latest approved version of that template. The second thing it does is it drives popular metadata. People hate filling metadata in. But just by selecting the template, we've already assigned the fact that it's an environmental assessment report. OK, and we can search on these individually to bring back the information in the future. We haven't relied on someone typing the word environmental and mistyping on missing out the N or putting ENV dot because they can't be bothered to spell it all out. So we're capturing metadata that's very, very useful for finding information in the future. What it's also doing is giving us a much flatter folder structure. 
you can see under assessments, I don't have a subfolder called environmental or one called risk assessment or one called safety. So it allows us to have a much flatter structure. So in the future, for those people who don't like searching and like to just navigate around folders, you know, in a year's time, you're not clicking on a folder thinking, oh, nothing in there, nothing in there, nothing in there, because not every project will have a, a large number of every type of document. So we can keep it a lot tighter, a lot easier for people to navigate and find documentation just by navigation, never mind searching. Um, so what I'm going to do is select the environmental, and what these also do is look around arrows, it define what metadata is going to be prompted for in the next screen. So if I was doing a minutes of meeting, for example, I might be asked for meeting room or meeting date or next meeting date, those kind of things. But in this case, I'm just asked for a description. So this is my oops, my document. I'll, I'll spell that correctly for you. Okay. And we've got so we've got free type. You've got um, blue and grey. So we've got red, blue and grey. Red is mandatory. You have to fill it in. If you don't fill it in, it won't let you continue. Grey, you don't have to fill in, but uh, it's just saying that you can fill it in. And blue is preferred. So if you don't fill a blue one in, it will say um, we would like you to fill this in, but we will let you continue. Now, they're just for information. They're your metadata. But these pieces of metadata up here, level, location, role, are keywords that help drive the numbering system. So in this case, if we come down and say no level applicable, and we come to role, and we say, yep, it's architect, hit next, you can see that it's automatically generating our ISO 19650 compliant number. But I don't really have to understand that. I don't need to be trained. I just picked that it was architect and that it was no level applicable. But the PR7 and the OPE came from the project folder structure. Okay, two of the components came from the keywords that we just selected when we populated them. But the other two came from what type of template we chose. So it's a combination of the three, where you are in the structure, what type of template you've chosen, and any additional metadata. If you had one big folder called miscellaneous, the number of good system could be just driven by keywords. Or if your folder structure completely represents the coding system, then you don't need any additional keywords. It'll be all predefined just by where you're creating the document. So it's the level of flexibility there, depending on how much flexibility you want to give your users. So now you can see here, it's created the document PR7 OPA REX ENA automatically for me. And that's fine. And I can double click that document and obviously it'll turn it blue It'll check it out to my work area where I can work and edit on it. And you can see it now says here, which is one of the keywords I typed in. It's got automatically the reference in there that we generated. It's got my um, information that I typed in for my description. And it's also got the version. But it's also got the information from the project, the Glasgow Airport runway extension. So we enter the information once. It might have been put in automatically by our PIM system. And it gets reused throughout every document type in Cabinet. So you can see this automated. And it also knows who I am and the date. So it can put those information in for me as well. So we can close that. We can check the file in. Importing a document, that was creating a document, but obviously importing a document, instead of saying new document, you just say import, and you go through exactly a similar kind of thing. But this way in time, instead of um, dictating what template to choose, it's saying you can only bring it in if it's a Word or a PDF. So you can't bring it in text file format, for example. But again, these are completely configurable. You define what these are called, what file types you allow to give you a level of control so that you end up getting good quality data in the file formats that you want that data in. Okay, so creating and importing a general document is pretty straightforward. Creating a Revit project, very similar, we just go to drawings, architectural in this case, we'll go to model, and in here I'll just create myself a new project. Okay, so I'll just say right click, new document, so it's like we did before, but this time I've only got the choice of one. You may have multiple Revit projects and you may have different ones for different versions, all those kind of things. But in my case, I've just got the one. So I'll just hit next. Again, we're getting populated. This time it's not asking for my role because it's getting the role from the fact we're in a folder called architectural, or one of our parent folders is. So therefore, in this information, it's asking for volume and it's asking for level. Again, you can define what you want to prompt the user for my model. Again, it's going to automate the naming convention following the standard for my Revit model. 
and hit finish. Now, I can open this document much like I would any other one. I could double click it, I could uh, right click open, doesn't matter, but it's going to open the document. In this case, it's going to open it in Revit. So it knows what version to open. This is a Revit 2016 template, so let's open it up in Revit 2016. Now, once, once this opens, we could go about creating this as a central model. We could go about putting this into collaboration for Revit or a Revit server, however you work. And there are different workflows and different flows of how you work with the three individual uh, ways of working. Or you may use it just um, single person, single Revit file as well. So there's four different ways of working uh, with Revit. Um, so again, we allow you to just use your gen the normal tools which are built into Revit. We don't try and replace those tools. You still use the collaborate button. You still tell it to go into Revit server or you tell it to become a central model file. It's entirely up to you how you work. Um, but I'm not going to go through all that. That's a Revit demonstration. Um, what I'm going to go through is the fact that I've opened the Revit project and you can see, much like when we had the um, project information brought into our Word document, our project summary file and our report, it's also come into our Revit sheets. So you can see it says DMV Consult in Glasgow Airport. But obviously we don't have an individual sheet record yet. We haven't, we've only created a model. We haven't created a record for the sheet itself. So we need to go ahead and do that. So what I'm going to do is come into here and say, I'm going to assign a sheet because we've got an existing sheet inside our Revit project. You can see it's unassigned, so we'll say assign. And it pops up our mini cabinet explorer. In this case, we're going to say put it into sheets because that's where we want to keep our sheets, him import. And we go through very similar as if we were creating a document. But in this case, not only the green arrows defining uh, the type, it's an existing site, it's an existing building, it's also driving our drawing series. So the first two digits of our drawing sheet are going to be 04 because we're doing an existing building in this case. Again, it's going to pop up with the naming code. So I can say this is 03, level, and I'll just put level one. And then we just put my first sheet and hit next. And you can see it's going to create 0401. So it's not 001, it's 0401. So we can use it to drive drawing series as well. And we just let that go away now. Move my hand away from the mouse, not that you can tell, but it has, that has. Now it says my first sheet. It's got my initials in there because it knows who I am. It's put in the uh, number that it's automatically generated for us. It's also put the status in there of S0 and the revision of PO101 and the purpose of initial status. You may have work in progress draft, however you want to name it. It's entirely up to you. But we also want to create some new sheets. So let's create some. Uh, first of all, obviously you pick your title block that like you would normally in Revit. Uh, again, same location, but this time these are one for concept buildings. So we hit next. Okay, again, pick some naming conventions, what you want to fill in. Uh, my second sheets, I'll call it, because what we're going to do is I actually want two of those. It's going to start at 1401 because obviously that's the first number available, but it's going to create 1401 and 1402. So I hit finish and leave that for a second. And if we look down in the bottom left hand corner here, you can see now under my sheet section, I've now got an 04 and a 14. And 14, I've got two sheets and obviously I've got one sheet under there. And again, it's filled that information in for me. Okay, so we've created some sheets, auto populated following the BS alumni, uh, sorry, was BS1192, now ISO 19650 numbering system. If we go into here, back to our first original sheet, once you've created your sheets, you've done your drawing content, you've done your drawing composition, your detailing, etc., you obviously want to export those sheets. And we've got different things we can do. We can export the sheets as PDFs, DWGs, etc., much like Revit can. Uh, in this case, we're going to tell it to export the sheets. We can say, okay, which sheets do you want to export? Well, we want to do all of them, so export. Now we've got it configured to export as DWGs. You can do PDF if you want, it's not it's up to you. But you'll see why we've chosen DWGs in a moment to show you some additional functionality that Cabinet brings for DWGs. So it just helps to produce the DWGs at this stage. So once that is finished, we go back to uh, Cabinet and we can see in our Sheets folder, Oh, just, it's just interrupted me, it's just reminded me. One of the bigger 
problems when you're using raster images inside of Revit is that when you export a CGPG out of Revit, it will allow you to flatten any linked files into a 1D GPG file, but any raster images, i.e. like we've got here, these um, images of the actual building, then it won't flatten those. It wants to bring those in as separate files, but obviously that would be useful, useless to us if we weren't bringing those into cabinet as well. So it's just reminding, reminding us that we have them and they haven't been brought in before. So what we're gonna do is just put them into the rendering area hit import what type are they well we've only got one type of rendering you could have multiple types of rendering but we just have the one and um, we're just going to bring those in and it'll bring them in with the names that Revit is expecting to find in order to resolve them so as i was going to back to Revit, back to our sheets folder and you can see i now have my three sheets exported out of Revit, all following the iso 1960 19650 um, naming convention all of the correct versioning and the status codes and we've automatically created those without really understanding or having to understand the numbering system we at some point we filled a couple of keywords in but apart from that that's what we did and we followed various other things in in English but for those people who don't know what um, the O3 component means you could have these like we have here additional columns on the right hand side so you can see here this is volume O3 so that's why it's an O3 it's level O1 that's what O1 means we're in the uh, sheets so if it's a drawing and an architecture so that's fine as well but the O4 that's existing building and we can filter on those and sort, sort on them and search on them etc so you don't have to understand all these codes it's going to automate that for you. It's going to populate your title blocks for you or your heads and footage, your documents. And it's going to give you descriptive English terms along the side here as well. So if we now come into um, Lewis and looking at search, if you hit this button here up at the top, it's search or filter. If you're doing it within a folder, it's really a filter because you're filtering down the list of results that you have in that this view. And we can search on absolutely anything that you've pre-configured and we've got a lot of stuff configured here for demo purposes but if you go to search you can look at your predefined searches now we have an area where we create searches which are relevant to potential clients which everybody in the organization can see and you also have your own searches as well so if you want to create a new search and save one so for example i've got one called document register so if we go to project one and we want to create a document register all we do is click on project one where we want to start our search from hit search and say run search and it creates and finds all the documents that we have shared to our client okay everything that we've delivered and shared to our client including previous versions so if they've sent them multiple versions they're all in this list we can then do control a for any kind of report you can obviously save it and we can export it now we can export that view either as a report and that would just be like a tabular formed report where you put a header on some color scheme that you like or we can do as a matrix and the matrix is there because obviously people want to generate the data for creating document registers so if i say let's create this as a matrix rather than a report because that's quite simple go into the temp folder and hit save it says it's done it if i then go to our temp folder here's my document register so all i do is double click on it and it's brought it all out. So there's all the things I delivered to my client. They're the versions I delivered on that date, and that's the version I delivered on that date. So we've got that information automatically available to us, and it's by date. Just by coming into here, so for example, if you delete all this, you can see it's all live. And all I do is swap the version over to the stage and say, right, export the current view again, but I've all done is swapped version and stage over. okay i now have it by version rather than by date so there's lots of different things you can do i do with that okay so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at bim manager well you can see the first point there is ensure iso 19650 compliance well we're doing that you can see we're ensuring that the numbering system and the data that's populated into your documents is automated so from day one from right from the beginning use latest of templates use latest name convention it's all populated next thing you want to do once they've done the content and produced the document or export the sheets or revit is to put those sheets or documents through approval process 
Whilst we go through that approval process internally, we want to generate PDFs for people to review and mark up and redline, but we also want to generate the PDFs and the IFC files automatically for delivery to our client as part of our EIR. And then we want to deliver them automatically into the common data environments. We don't have to do it manually. And we don't want to deliver the files. We want to deliver the metadata as well. But also we want to keep a copy of what we deliver. We want to maintain the copies of the information that we deliver to our clients. So if we get turned off from, let's say, their BIM 360 system, we've still got a copy of our IP of what we delivered to the client. So if we come back here now, and let's go back into folders and let's go back to our project seven drawing okay our sheets so we create this first sheet here if you remember it came out of revit so what i'm going to do is go right click workflow and say send for checking hit next and at this point i can leave a note if i want to so please check this hit next you then get a list of um checkers and that's because they're defined by their role but it's also defined by the project we're currently working in now obviously you can multi-select people and become a first come first served or everybody has to approve it before it moves forward basis but in this case i'm just going to send it to myself because i don't want to, have to log in and out of uh, my work my desktop in order to act as different people now what happens here you can see it says pending but what's happened here is we've actually sent this off to a back-end processor and it's basically a workflow engine. What the workflow engine does is many things, but what it's doing in this case is just making sure the IDL is in sync so that we have got exactly the right IDL. It's resolving the XREFs if there's any XREF problems, it's resolving the XREFs, finding them if they've gone missing links, and then it's generating them as a PDF automatically. And then it's going to send an email to the checker to tell them that there's something to be done. Obviously, I don't have to wait for that to happen, I could get on, get on with my job and doing other things. But as you can see, an email's come in. So now you have to imagine I'm the checker, I'm sat at a different machine, a different uh, desktop, and I've just received an email from my colleague who authored this document and they've sent it for me for checking. And you can see it says, please check this. I can follow the link, it'll take me straight to the file that I'm going to work on, or I can go to documents for my attention. It's a bit like a to-do list. It's this special folder at the top of the tree where it's everything I've been asked to be involved in some kind of workflow for approval, checking, independent checking, whatever it may be for the workflow you're working on. If I just follow the link, it takes me straight to the document. So I'm now the checker on a different machine. I could preview it in AutoCAD if I want to and print it out. If that's the way you do your reviewing and checking, you can still do that. But we also have the option using Cabinet because it generated a PDF as it went through the system automatically. And I can see the fact it says, please check this. And we have Redline markup tools. You could do it all just as a PDF if you want to. But if you don't want to, obviously you can print it out or use AutoCAD, however you want to work. We're not trying to force you to it one way, we're just giving you options. And you can see check by is not filled in because it hasn't been checked yet. I haven't done it. But you can still see it says for checking. So if I was to print this out, I would know the difference between the for checking print and the work in progress or the in initial status print. So now I'm going to say accept and hit next. I could reject it and obviously the person would get an email back with a red email telling them they'd been rejected. Again, different list of people. Angus the approvers here at the moment, but now I'm going to pick myself. So you get a different list of people because they're approvers. Again, it says pending because it's going to issue it up into the workflow engine in order for it to generate me a new PDF because we need to put the word for approval in there, for example. So it's going to say for approval, generate me a new PDF, send that email off to the approver. They'll get a link. They can follow the link. It takes them to talk to my attention or into the actual product uh, file itself and they can review it from there. So again, I'll get an email come back to me and it's now, as you can see, for approval. The email will pop up here in a moment, but we won't wait for that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to right click workflow approve because I'm now happy to go and let's have a look at this file. Again, use markup tools, see any comments that have been left by anybody. I can see that it now says for approval. It's also stamped in the initials of the checker for me automatically. So that's great, all looks good to me, so I'm gonna accept it. Okay, so this is getting it to the point where you're internally approving the document so that you're happy to it's ready for delivery to the client. Now, what we wanted to do next once we've approved it, is share it. We want to deliver that to the client into the common data environment. And we want to do that by providing them with the correct PDF. Now, normally what I'd have to do is ask somebody to open up all those 300 PDFs, change it to the word uh, for sharing or sh sharing for review and comment or whatever you're doing, uh, change it from S0 to S3 and drop the minor version from PO101 to PO1. 
but we don't want to do that. And then we'll take a copy of it and put it into our shared area. So under our shared area, we've got a much flatter structure. And you can see I've got an architectural and it's empty at the moment. But if we go back to our sheets, and I say, right, you know, it's all the time it's leading me by the hand. I can only do what I'm allowed to do. And that's defined by who I am and what my role is. So other people might get different options. But in this case, I can share this for review and comment. So instead of opening it up, I'm obviously doing one file at a time, but you could do 300, just like them all and put them all through at the same time, it doesn't matter manner. But what it's gonna do is generate me a PDF, but I don't want it to generate a PDF for this. This is my approved copy. This is my WIP version. I need to retain this. What I actually want it to do is take a copy of this file, update that title block information to be S3, review and comment and drop the minor version, generate me a PDF for that and put that new DWG and PDF into my shared area, okay? So that's what I need it to do. But as well as putting it into my shared area at P01, so it's dropped the minor version, at S3, so it's not S0 anymore. And obviously I can view the PDF version here. And there it is. It now says S3 P01 review and comment. But more importantly, what I want it to do is deliver it to my client. So my client is using, in this case, BIM 360 docs. So we're just going to refresh BIM 360 docs. Depends how uh, their backend processes are working, but let's hope they're running well today. There we go. So now our file has been delivered automatically to our client. But our client said that we want you to put in the status and version into the name of the file. So it also did that on upload. It renamed the file and delivered the PDF up into the client environment or into our own CDE, depending on whose CDE is you're delivering to. And obviously, like you say, we have four different projects with four different clients using uh, four different CDEs, common data environments. So having to learn and understand how to deliver into each of those environments is a pain. Whereas we don't have to, Cabinet's gonna do it. In fact, me as the person who just shared it, don't, don't even know I've done it. I don't even know that I've just delivered that into the client's environment at S3, P01 for review and comment. It's done it for me. It's also done the file management component of it and put it into my shared area. Okay, but what we also want to do then is come into here for our shared one. What if we want to then say, right, let's say it's constructed. Next, next, finish. It says pending on the end, it's gone off to the back end. I want to take a copy of this, I want to retain our shared version, but I want to take a copy of it and put that into our Project 7 published area. As you can see, there's nothing there at the moment. So if we just go back in here and wait a second, give it a moment to generate that PDF, so it's going to copy the file. Now, can imagine if you're doing this manually, having to open up, change the title block, the room for human error in making that change, especially when you're doing 300 of them and you forget where you are and which ones you've done and which ones you haven't done. Whereas in this case, you select them all, you say share it and you go and do some other job, which you're getting, your company's being paid for. So rather than you just sat there waiting, watching your processor go around. Okay, so all we need to do now is just refresh BIM 360 documents management. So I'll give that a second. And what our system does is detects that it's already there, so it makes it a version two, so it's using the proper versioning history of BIM 360, and delivers it into the environment with a CR, C01 named, and you can do it either way around. But you can see here now, what we've delivered to our client now says CR, C01 as constructed. Okay, so, we just go back to here, what we've got, we've started from the very beginning, <coughs> structured, structured folder structure, using your structured um, templates, the naming convention is all automated, the population of your title blocks, your headers and your footers, etc., are populated, are automated. It's uh, managing and leading the users through the workflow so they only can do the right thing at the right time so they make sure it goes through the right review and approval process. It's generating the outputs automatically and it's delivering to your client automatically. And it's maintaining your copies of what you've delivered. If you then go and do that document register against project seven, you'd now get those files that we've just delivered to our client. So it's just showing a very quickly beginning to end automation. I'll pass you back to Gary now who will uh, go through here because all we can ask for now is some questions if there are any. Uh... That's great, thanks 
Daniel, I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay, having taken back control. Um, so that brings us up to the hour mark or thereabouts. So thank you very much for your time and attendance. And we hope today we've given you a good insight, not only into Grey Tech, but the cabinet software that we've purchased. Um, so quickly, in summary, you know, with cabinet, what we're really trying to do is help every business to improve efficiency. That's the key word. Help you to increase profitability on your projects. You know, and overall, we're more business. If you're sending up good data to the common data environment, you've been seen as the preferred partner of choice. And you're going to make that tier one main contractor level's life a lot easier as they're ultimately responsible for delivering that BIM level two project. So we've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, sometimes tricky with, with document management, but we'll leave it open for a couple of minutes. Uh, you can type your questions in on the, on the panel. Uh, if not, I will follow up with everybody thereafter. And if everybody would like some more information, then um, I'll drop an email shortly with all of my details on. So I'll just leave it open for a, a minute or two. Um, but as we come to an end, thank you very much for your attendance and hope to speak to you soon.